Hey Life Church, I'm Jake Calhar. I'm a senior at Arlington High School graduating in this year's class of 2019. And I just really want to thank you guys for, for your support and everything Life Church has done for, for Canvas as a whole and especially with the camps. Camp for me has been a big factor in my life in determining who I am today. I came in as a freshman, kind of didn't really know what I was getting myself into, didn't know where I was at with my faith. And, and I'd gone to church camps before and you know, so I didn't have that high of expectations going in. So when I got to high school, I'd never been to a high school camp. So this was a first for me. And, you know, seeing the changes that he was making in these kids' lives was just something I'd really never seen before. And that night, I really felt the Holy Spirit for the first time. And, and it was the most, one of the most powerful things I've ever felt. And if you're a parent and you have a kid who's maybe debating on whether he should go to camp or not, I will tell you from firsthand experience, it's not like any other church camp. This, this camp is something special. They will experience God for the first time and it is amazing. So a day at summer camp looks like this. You wake up, you have two hours of worship, our amazing bands out there playing songs. And then we all get together and we go out. We go out and go inner tubing. I got to wakeboard, water ski. We even get to go cliff jumping if you're into that. Kind of anything you're into, we got it here at, at church camp. So, I mean, camp kind of turned things around for me. I came home from camp, um, really was making a big impact in my school, inviting kids to camp who maybe maybe don't have the funds to pay for camp. And, and everything you guys do helps. And I just want to thank you guys as a whole for doing what you're doing. Make sure you come to summer camp this year, 2019, if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, the ending was kind of dumb, but. <laughs> that is one of our graduates, uh, Jake Kalahar, and he went to winter camp for the first time three and a half years ago as a freshman and experienced the Holy Spirit for the first time in his life. And when he said he came back a different person, he came back a different person. He came back and went into his school, and he saw kids differently. He saw it as a mission field. He saw those kids who were sitting alone in the cafeteria and he just began to sit down with them and befriend them. Jake uh, is graduating this year, knows that God's calling him to be a pastor, and is going to Washington State University for some reason, so there's a mix up there. But, uh, <laughs> but Jake preached at our youth group on senior night on Tuesday night and did an amazing job about how he's, he's been struggling this year with his faith. And God has been speaking this word into his heart that do not grow weary in doing good because at just the right time, you're going to reap a harvest of blessing. And he preached to our students. And on Wednesday, when we were writing this script for this video, he comes in and he just, hey, I met a new kid today at school and he's graduating with me. First time I met him and he couldn't afford a haircut for graduation. So I took him and got him a haircut and I invited him to church and he's going to go to camp. So what you guys do when you give today, we're going to receive our camp scholarship offering. If you are able to give in that offering, that's fantastic. It's just going to be at the same time at the end of the message. And thank you for what you do. Even if you don't go to camp, you're investing into the lives of students and that you're impacting people's eternities through your giving. And so I want to say as, our, as the youth pastor, thank you. And we're going to celebrate our class of 2019. There's 17 graduates. So I'm going to kind of go through it quickly, and then they're going to stand, and we're going to honor them. But it's been so cool. This is my sixth and a, I've been here for six and a half years. And my first year I was here, I had one senior. She's in the back running this entire service from a production standpoint. And now I have 17 seniors that we get to send into the mission field that God has placed them in, whether it's the workplace, whether it truly is the mission field. So when I'm done going through these, would you guys just give them a round of applause? So the first one is Zoe Dockstetter. She is graduating from, of course, you guys are the first ones to clap. And I said, no clapping till the end. Here we go. It's going to be a long time here. She is planning on attending Everett Community College in the fall. She will get her AA degree there and then transfer to Western, University, Western Washington University to complete her teaching degree. And she plans on teaching elementary children at Open Arms Village that we talked about last week in Kenya. She plans on being a missionary in Kenya. Ben Reed is graduating from Everett Community College and as well as Stanwood High School with his AA degree, and he'll be receiving a diploma in, with an AFA, an Associate of Fine Arts in Photography. And this next year, he'll be pursuing an internship and a career in photography. Blake Landry is graduating from Arlington High School and plans to attend Central Washington University to become a commercial pilot. Jake Kalahar, which you guys just met, is graduating from Arlington High School and plans to attend Washington State University in the fall. 
His older brother, Drew Kalahar, graduated from George Fox University and is going to graduate school at Washington State as well. Kayla Couch is graduating from Arlington High School and going to EVCC in the fall to study dental, to become a dental hygienist. Kristen Gano plans to, she graduated from homeschool, I call it Gano Academy, and uh, she is planning on taking a year off to save some, uh, to take a year off and save some money, and she is a gifted worship leader. She's been leading worship since she was in eighth grade in our youth ministry, and she's led on Sunday mornings, and her goal is to be a worship pastor. And Brenna Dietz, graduating from Stanwood High School, and also she is uh, going to Skagit Valley College next year to get an AA in biology, and then she wants to go to uh, Washington State University to get her degree in zoology and then also her doctorate there as well. Gabrielle Gutierrez is graduating from Arlington High School, and she is going to YWAM Kona. Everybody say, aw. She gets to spend some time in Hawaii next fall. That's so exciting. Uh, Josh Cook is graduating from Arlington High School. Kellen Chu is graduating from Weston High School. His future plans are enlist in the Navy and serve three years in the engineering field. Claire Mathewson is graduating from Marysville Getchell High School and going to Grand Canyon University to major in healthcare administration. Nick Lauritsen is graduating from Marysville Getchell and plans, uh, his future plans are to work, pursue God, and meet new people. Austin Emery is graduating from Arlington High School and his future plans are to attend Honda Acura Technical Program at Shoreline College. Tanner Seamer is graduating from Arlington High School and has completed several credits at Everett Community College and is planning on attending Skagit Valley College for an AA in auto mechanics. Kaylana Tanilian graduated from Western Washington University and MAT School this year. And Chasen Dennis has graduated from Marysville Arts and Tech. If you're from the class of 2019, will you stand and we want to honor you? Yeah. That was a lot. I'm very proud of the class of 2019. I graduated in 2009, so I almost just said the class of 2009. Um, but today we are continuing our series, The Names of God. And what I, I've loved about this series is seeing how, and, and all these stories have been in the Old Testament, of, of how God revealed himself to his people. And, and through that, most of the time, how God revealed himself to his people was when they were in the midst of a, of a trial. They were in the midst of a crossroads. They had some decisions that needed to be made, and God revealed himself in a powerful way. And before we, get, we jump into this message and look at the Lord as our shepherd, Jehovah Ra, I want to pray for our graduates, and I want to pray for us today. So God, I thank you so much for our class of 2019, and Lord, I know that this is just a small portion of the students who are graduating. Lord, I pray that above all else that they would trust in you with all of their heart and lean not in their own understanding and all of their ways acknowledge you. And God, your promise in that is that you're going to keep their path straight. Lord, I pray that they would hear from you, their shepherd, guiding and leading them, comforting them, strengthening them, and Lord, leading their lives. I pray, God, your blessing and anointing to be upon them as they go after the call that you've placed on their life. We thank you for them. And Lord, I pray for this message that you would speak through me, Lord, in a way that people can understand. Lord, I pray that right now you'd begin to work through the power of your Holy Spirit in our hearts, that there would be a silent message going on in all of our hearts where you are speaking to us directly. You are using the voice of the shepherd to speak hope and life and comfort into us today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can rewind and, and remember when you graduated, this question pops up even like when you're a junior in high school. And you get asked it all the time. And when I was a senior 10 years ago, I got sick of this question because I didn't really have it figured out yet. The question is, what's next? What are your plans next year? What are you going to be doing with your life? What, what degree do you want to pursue? What, what school are you going to? And it's like all of these questions and all of these things stack up. And it's kind of overwhelming at times if you're not a planner. And, and another way that to really, as I think about, like, what's your next step and how can we talk about that today is, What's leading you to that? What's really guiding you through this life, helping you make the decisions that help you move your life forward, move you to a place that God has you, he created you for and he has for you? What's, what are the kids doing back there today? Sounds like a gaggle of geese back there. What is the driving factor of life that's moving you forward? And I think so often in life, what begins to happen is that the busyness of life clouds out God's voice in our life. 
that we miss out on what God has for us because we're so busy. It seems like every conversation that I have in the lobby and people ask me, hey, how are you doing? Or I ask, hey, how are you doing? What is the answer? I'm busy. I'm busy. It seems like everybody has just been caught with the chronic case of busyness. And I think that the enemy is using our busyness to cloud out God's voice. That if the, if the devil can't make us bad, he's going to make us busy. Because when we're busy, we're not taking the time to tune out all of the other voices to hear the voice of the shepherd. And so often we let our emotions become the driving force that's leading us through life. You ever had seasons of life that your emotions have guided you through your decision making of what's next for your life? And it kind of seems that like it's just up and down and you're being led by every single emotion that you feel. The problem is that is that it leads us to places that are away from God and what he has for us. The prophet Jeremiah said that, that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who truly knows how wicked the human heart is? That our emotions can play tricks on us and we make decisions based on the way that we feel and then we get far away from God and then we're like, God, where are you? God, wh where are you at? Why don't you like, will you bless what I'm trying to do here? Or, or we're led by what job we have. We're led by our career. We're led by our five-step plan. We're led by all of these other things and we're missing out on the voice of the shepherd who wants to lead us into a place of abundance with Jesus. And we, get, we miss out. And I just, as we were worshiping, I just felt impressed that some of you today, you feel stuck with God. And the thing that I just couldn't get out of my heart, and I believe it's where a lot of you are at today, is that God has told you to do something. He's asked you to step out in faith. He's asked you to trust him. And you just haven't taken that step yet. It's not that you're away from God, it's that God has called you to do something, the voice of the shepherd has led you, and you just haven't taken the step yet. Because you're trying to figure everything out, instead of walking by faith, you're trying to trust in your own strength and your own understanding. And God wants to guide you by the voice of the shepherd. He wants to be close to you. He doesn't want you just to be led by your emotions. Emotions are okay. We, uh, we have to learn how to manage our emotions. And King David in the book of Psalms is where we're going to be at today, where we see the Lord reveal himself as the Lord is our shepherd, Jehovah Ra'ah. It's through this King David character. And if you're new to the Bible, the book of Psalms is a collection of songs written by a bunch of different authors, authors that really, I think, is a perfect window into the heart of the human being. These songs are songs of celebration. These songs are songs of hope and God's love and his goodness to us. There's also songs of like, God, are you there? God, do you care about my life? I don't think you're there. I would rather die. Lord, help me. And there's all these different songs. And, and we see like a season of King David's life in Psalm 22 because he wrote a lot of these songs. In Psalm 22, before Psalm 23, we see that David is just like really struggling with his emotions. So much so that he says this in Psalm 22, one through two, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very words that Jesus said on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. This guy is not having a good day. He is like, God, do you care about my life? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? It, like in the middle of this, in Psalm 22, 12 through 15, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open, their mouths are wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. This guy is desperate. He, like his emotions are all out of whack. He is just going and just telling God how he feels, which is okay to do. He's letting God know that right now I'm not doing good, but it's so crazy the shift that he makes at the end of Psalm 22. He begins to recognize that his life, the richness, the abundance of life isn't about here. It's not about the things that are going on here. If you read the story of David, there are times when life was amazing and there's times where he's at the brink of death. And he learned that it's an internal wholeness and identity and identifying with the Lord as his shepherd that he could speak hope and life into his heart. 
Here's what he says at the end, end of Psalm 22. He says, I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. I don't know where you find yourself today. If you're being led by your emotions, you feel stuck with God because he's, the voice of the shepherd has called you to do something you haven't done. I don't know what's the driving force, what's propelling you forward as you look at the next step because it's not just our graduates today that have a next step. The theme verse of our youth ministry is Ephesians 2.10, which says, For we are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good works that were set before us long ago. And I don't believe that's just for young people. I believe that's for every single person, that you have a purpose, that before God created the foundations of the earth, he thought about your life and has good plans, good works for you to walk in. And so many of us have been caught up in the busyness of life and the the voice of God has been clouded out by our cell phones and our jobs and our families, all things that can be healthy. But an overdose of them, too much of them, is clouding out the voice of God who wants to desperately lead us to a place of abundance, to a rich and satisfying life of wholeness in him. I love that King David was this young shepherd boy in in 1 Samuel 16 when Samuel was looking for the new king of Israel. And he goes to the house of Jesse, and there's eight boys there. And he goes through all of them, and and the Lord says, nope, he's not here. He's not here. He's not. The next king isn't here. So he asks Jesse, where, do you have any more kids? And he goes, oh, yeah, the shepherd boy is out tending our flock. And David becomes the, the king of Israel. He's anointed king, but he has to wait this long period of time as King Saul pursues him and tries to kill him. And he goes through all of this, and as he's reflecting about who God is in the midst of all the, the chaos of his life, through victories, through ups and downs. And David was known as a man after God's own heart. He committed murder and adultery. But yet every time he turned his face back to the shepherd, and he says this about his God in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What an amazing shift in one chapter for David to be crying out to God that you're not there, but then to have the, the, the connection that the Lord is his shepherd. And when I read that, I just imagine the most peaceful scene. That it doesn't matter what's going on out here, but when the Lord is your shepherd, when the Lord is the, his voice is the one that's guiding you and leading you to a place of, of wholeness and to a place of, of a rich and satisfying life, there's peace in that. That our next step is that we have to tune our hearts to the voice of the shepherd who desperately wants to lead us. What is guiding you through this life? What is propelling you to this next step? As we celebrate these graduates and their next step, God has something for you. When was the last time you stopped and asked God for what's next? When was the last time that you were intentional to say, Lord, you are the the leader of my life. You are the shepherd of my life. What is it that you want to lead me to next? but we get so caught up in this life, we get so caught up in our circumstances in the moment that we're missing out on how God wants to use us, how God wants to speak to us, how God wants to comfort us, how God wants to give us rest. I said rest, God wants to give you rest. He wants to give you peace. He wants to be your joy. He wants to be your wholeness that you're seeking for in this life. When was the last time you gave him 10 minutes of your time without a phone sitting next to you, without some music playing, that you just said, God, I want you to speak to me. I need your voice to be guiding me through this life. But we get so caught up in all of this. Why would God use this metaphor as us as sheep and him as the shepherd so often through life? I was asking that this week, and so I looked, what is it about sheep that that resonates with us as human beings? And the first is that they're not very smart. They're just not very smart animals. They're very stubborn. 
They're very prideful animals. Sheep are so stubborn that they will only be led by their shepherd if somebody else tries to lead them because you cannot drive a sheep. If you've watched a cattle drive, try that with a sheep. They will look at you like, what are you trying to do here, buddy? You can lead a sheep into a pasture and they will eat all of it and they won't leave. They'll eat all of it and they'll, they're so stubborn, they will stay in a field, they will eat the feces of the other sheep and then they'll die unless they're led. They are stubborn, prideful animals and they tend to wander. It's like God's trying to say like, it's basically what a human does. We tend to wander. We're very stubborn. We want it our way. And here's the thing that I think really God's trying to say is that sheep cannot be led without a shepherd. They can't survive without a shepherd. They need someone to bring comfort and protection and life and guidance through this life so that they can survive. And God, this metaphor is this beautiful imagery that God desperately wants a relationship that he knows us and we know him. See, a shepherd knows all of his sheep, and a sheep will follow only the voice of the shepherd that they know. What is the main voice that you are tuning into in your life? Is it your bank account? Is it the emotion that you feel? Is it anxiety? Is it depression? I don't know what voice that you're, you're tuning into. Is it propelling you forward with God or is it hindering you? Is it causing you to be closer to the shepherd and following his voice or is it making you wander and get away farther from him and you try to do it on your own strength and in your own understanding? Sheep cannot survive without the shepherd. And today as we celebrate, I want to highlight, I want to point, I want to hide you in the fact that the good shepherd came, Jesus came to guide us and bring us to the rich and satisfying life he has for us. If you have time this week, I don't have time. I wanted to read all of John chapter 10, but Matt's like, we don't have time for that today. So if you have time, please read all of John chapter 10 this week. Read it. It's an amazing chapter. Jesus is getting ready to go to Jerusalem to give his life, and he's talking to these Pharisees. And he says this in John 10, 9 through 11. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. What Jesus is trying to say is that there's going to be a lot of different things that are coming after your heart. There's going to be a lot of people say there's different ways to get to heaven. There's different ways to have this rich and satisfying life that I came for. But what Jesus is doing, he's painting this picture. Back then, what they used to do, they used to create these pens for sheep that were like, you couldn't climb over. There was like this gate that you had to, and they only had one opening. And what the shepherd would do at night is that he would lay down in front of the gate, and he would be the gate. That the only way to get in to the safety and protection of the pen was to go through the shepherd. Jesus says, I am the gate. It's as Jesus is saying, I am the only way to get to the Father. I am the only way to get into this rich and satisfying life, this wholeness that you are seeking, all this other stuff that's vying for the attention of your heart. The only thing that's going to bring wholeness is through me. The only thing that's going to bring you a rich and satisfying life now and a hope for all eternity with your Father is through me. There's no other way. The thief comes in to steal, kill, and destroy your life, but I came that you may have life and life abundantly in me. And then he says, I am the good shepherd. He's not a hired hand that would run in the face of danger. He is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. He says in verse 14 that my sheep know me and I know them and they know my voice. Do you know the voice of your shepherd? Do you know the voice of Jesus that wants to bring you into an abundance? But Jesus says, I'm going to bring you into this pasture. I'm going to bring you into this rich and satisfying life. But he says, I'm the gate that brings you in, and I'm also the gate that sends you out. As if to say, it's not just about staying and and going here. It's like, there's a mission out there. I want to lead you to other places that people would see the richness of life that you have so that you could go out and reach other lost sheep. Read Luke 15, the heart of Jesus is that he would leave the 99 sheep who know him to go after the one who doesn't. He desperately wants people to have a relationship with him. He says, I'm the good shepherd who's going to lay down my life. I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep because I love them. Jesus is our good shepherd. And in Psalm 23, here's what we see. If you guys can put that back up on the screen. I'm just going to kind of go through this verse and, and show you what the good shepherd wants for your life. Verse 1. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. The Lord wants to be your provision. He doesn't just want to provide for you. He wants to be Jehovah Jireh and be your provider. That he, like you, with Jesus, you lack nothing. When you have him, there's a wholeness that when you are, are identified as his son or daughter, that there's a wholeness that can't be taken from you. That you lack nothing in him. Verse two, the shepherd leads us to a place of abundance, green pastures. He leads me to green pastures. He leads me to still waters. Why? Because sheep can't drink from a moving stream. Sheep have to drink from slow moving water. It's like God knows what you need and he's gonna bring you there. And so often we think this is going to be like material things out here. No, it's in here. God knows what you need. He wants to lead you to a place of rest. Verse 3, he refreshes us. He leads us to a right standing with the Father, the right path for our life. Verse 4, he will comfort and protect you in the darkest valley. And if you're in a dark valley right now, you need to know that the Lord has not left you. No, his rod and his staff, they will comfort you and protect you, and he will not leave you. Verse 5, he's preparing a feast for you. He's preparing a place for you in all eternity. He wants this relationship with you. It's not just for here and now. It's for all eternity. Verse 6, I love how he closes this out. And surely, you can be sure of this, that his goodness and his unfailing love will pursue you all the days of your life. Jesus will not stop pursuing you. His voice has not left you. Have you been clouded out by the business of life? Have you not taken that step of obedience and it's clouding out the voice of God that he's calling you to move forward to a place of a rich and satisfying life in him? It's not about having just peace in all of your circumstances. It's about trusting the shepherd in all time. And that's what David's saying. This Psalm 23 is this declaration of trust in his shepherd. What he's saying is, Lord, basically, I'm, I surrender my life to you. I trust you. I trust your leadership. I trust that your voice will be the voice that will lead me to these places. Can you trust that it's God's voice that will be leading you to the places of a rich and satisfying life, to a place of, of rest and abundance in him? God desires this relationship with his creation. Sin distorted this relationship. Sin fractured the relationship that God intended with his children. So he sent the good shepherd to lay down his life as a one-time sacrifice. And Jesus Christ rose again from the grave so that we can have life to the full now and a hope for an eternity with him. And he's not going to stop pursuing you with his goodness and his love until you take your last breath. It's as easy as turning to him. The Bible will say, repent. Repent. That you say, God, I know that I've been running away. I've been trying to lead my own life. I've been trying to do life on my own. I've been stuck, God, but I want you to be the good shepherd and your voice is the very thing that will lead me there. Where does his voice lead us? It is his voice, the voice of God, our shepherd that leads us to the rich and satisfying life that we desire. We can't do it without his voice guiding and leading us. We have to have the voice of the good shepherd speaking to us. Have you heard the voice of your shepherd calling to you? When was the last time you just took a moment to have the Lord speak to you? That you didn't have an agenda, that you went to him for him to try and bless your life in, in the circumstances that you're in or say, God, I trust you. God, all I need is you. I don't lack anything in you. Would your voice guide me? Would you direct me? Would you give me the, the direction and comfort and guidance or is the busyness of your life crowding out the voice of the shepherd calling you? There's this statistic that drives me insane as a, as a youth pastor. It was, it's what motivates me. There's this stat out there that says that 80% of students who grow up in church and then when they graduate, they stop going to church after they graduate. They walk away from the faith. That motivates me every single day. And I think one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why people are walking away from the church is because they're not experiencing the Holy Spirit. They're not experiencing the voice of the Lord guiding them. They don't know how to tune in to the voice of the Father. Five years ago, I told P Pastor Matt in a meeting, like we were doing games and our youth ministry was struggling. I was trying to figure out ministry and life. And I said, I can't do games anymore. It's driving me insane. He said, well, what are you gonna do? I said, we're gonna do a service. We're gonna give kids the Holy Spirit. It's better than any entertainment they can have. We're gonna go after this thing. We're gonna be on the mission of Jesus Christ to reach people who are far from him, and we're gonna love people who nobody else wants to love. And God has just been pouring out his spirit on my team, and he has been transforming lives by the power of his Holy Spirit, and we're praying desperately. That's why we do camp. 
because we believe if you can get kids out of the normal environment, you can get them in an environment where our people are investing love and hope and speaking about the hope of Jesus when they can get away from the normal pace of life, that they can tune into the voice of their shepherd who is calling them and leading them and guiding them to go home and make a difference in their community and in their world. I want to reach this generation before we have to rescue this generation. So let's invest into this next generation. That's why our kids' ministry, if you haven't been into our kids' ministry, go volunteer in there because the shepherd is speaking to those kids. He is transforming little hearts to be on mission for him, to go after it. As a father of two young boys, I love our children's ministry, that my two-year-old comes to church and he hears about Jesus at home. He hears about it at church. My kid wakes up on Sunday and says, church, let's go to church, dad. But at some point, my son's gonna have to not just listen to the voice of his earthly father, but I want my sons to know the voice of the shepherd guiding and leading their life. And it's gonna be a slow transition where I say, you need to trust the shepherd. Trust him. Because my kids aren't my own, they're his. And I want my kids to know the voice of their Abba, their, their shepherd, their Jehovah Ra, so desperately. And we have to take moments like camp where we can tune in to who God says we are and the plan that he has for our life. We're so passionate about camp here. It transformed my life. It's transformed many of our staff members' lives. I'm going to invite Pastor Matt to come back up and finish the service and just talk about his camp, his camp experience, and how God transformed his life at camp. I am so grateful for our youth team and our children's team. You guys are the heroes of this church. I, I, I just I thought I'm going to try something. If you serve in children's ministry or youth ministry, you please stand. Stand up, please. These are the heroes. Look around. Look around. Thank you, guys. I didn't do that last year. I was like, I just, I was think, sitting there thinking, like, how many of them are in here right now? Because they served last service, right? And it's like, there's a whole other team back there right now serving. And they're the heroes. And I say they're the heroes because God began to speak to my heart when I was a kid. See, I, I was a hostage at church. My mom and dad came to know Christ. My mom when I was 11, my dad when I was 12. And so when, when, when dad got saved, I had to go to church. Like it wasn't like I didn't have a choice anymore. I had to go to church. And, and the youth workers and the children's workers, they're my heroes because they're the ones that begin to speak into my heart. They begin to speak into my life. And then the Holy Spirit began to speak into my life. And you guys, we're praying every week that you would hear the voice of God when you're here at church. Did you know I'm also praying that you would hear the voice of God when you're at home? That you would hear the voice of God all the time. He is the good shepherd, and his sheep know his voice. And, and, and you guys, learning to hear this voice of God, it does take a little bit of effort. It does take a little bit of time. And for me, camp is such a big deal because by the time I went into my, my junior, my senior year of high school, I spent my whole junior year of high school running from God. My mom had, tell, my mom had told me like my whole life since I was 12 that you know, for five years, she said, you're going to be a pastor. I'm like going, I do not want to be a pastor. Okay, no way. You know, I mean, I want to go make lots of money. That's what I want to do. And so pastors that I knew didn't make any money. I'm like, I don't want to do that. And so I was just running from God. And I'd been to five different camps. And, and here was my problem. I would go to camp, and God would speak to my heart in such a powerful way that I would make just radical commitments to him in my heart. I would say, God, I'm all yours. God, I love you. You ever done that? Like, you say, God, I'm in. And you hear God's voice, and you say, God, I'm in. Well, then I would go home, and I'd get back into my life again and around all my friends and do all this stuff. And by the time camp would come around again, I would feel so far away from God. And then I'd go to camp and I'd hear his voice and I'd make another commitment to God. And then I would go home and, and just, this process went on for five years. And I went, finally, by the time my junior, I'm like, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. So I might as well just be, be real and just, I'm just not even going to serve God anymore. And about midway through my junior year of high school, my mom said to me, you know, Matthew, you're not fooling us. We know what you're doing. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, you know what I'm talking about. You're out every night of the week, and we know what you're doing. This isn't that big of a town. 
all right? We know what you're doing. You're running from God. And I'm like, don't judge me. Whenever kids say don't judge me, what that's code for you know what I'm doing, and I don't want you to know what I'm doing, and so I'm going to force you away from me. That's why they say don't judge me, okay? So I said, I'm like, don't judge me. You can't do it. And my mom's like going, look, I'm not judging you, all right? I just know. And you need to know that I know, and you need to know that Dad knows, and you need to know that God knows. And if you want to run from God, you go right ahead. If you want to go to hell, go right ahead. Me and your dad, we're not. And when she said that, I went, oh, you just told me what? And I just, you know, like, and she's like, go and look, you're not fooling anybody. But here's what happened that day. I felt in my heart, my mom turned me over to God. Mom and dad, there's a point when you turn your kids over to God. It's a, it's, a, it's a transitional thing that happens as they grow because the first way they hear God's voice is through you. You hear God's voice and you speak it into your family. But as they grow older, they need to start to hear his voice. And my mom, at a 17-year-old kid, she's been trying to do this in my life. And at this moment, it was like she's like, look, you're his. You choose to follow him or not. Your choice. So fast forward a few more months goes by and the end of the school year happens and, you know, I've just been doing all the stuff I've been doing and my mom says, you're going to camp. I said, I'm not going to camp. She says, you're going to camp. I said, I am not going to camp. I have to work. I got to pay for my car, blah, blah, blah. She goes, look, you live in my house. You're going to camp. Your dad and I have already decided you go to camp. Morgan's go to camp. That's what you're doing. And I'm like, no, I'm not. She goes, look, we've already, I've already told you, you are but I'll make you a deal. If you pay for it, which was my mom needed me to pay for it because they were broke. If you pay for it, you can drive your car and you take your brother and your cousin and you guys go to camp. And after one day, you have to stay an entire day. You have to stay an entire night. On the second day, if you don't want to be there anymore, you can come home. And my mom, and she prayed she fasted she cried out to god god get a hold of my boy's heart and i went to that first chapel service and i'd been to this guys this is my fifth this is my sixth camp at this time i'd been there i sat there like this i'm like just forget you i am not doing this and i didn't i got through that i'm like going sweet i'm out of here i told my brother i'm out of here They're like oh you are not leaving i'm like i am out of here in the morning dude i will be i'll be first out here well, they had this afterglow, which is just another way for them to have another service, okay? So, like, they had an afterglow, and uh, I go to the afterglow, and I'm sitting there going, you got, I got to be, you got to be kidding. I'm another one of these things. Great. And this guy got up. I don't even know who this guy is, because he, he just visited for the night. And he got up, and he told this story. He says, the captain of my football team. He was only a couple years older than us, so now he's in college. He's like, guys, you know, going to parties every night. I was hanging out with people every night. In fact, I had to be around people because every night when I would get home, I'd get home as late as I could get home, and I would lay in my bed, and I would still stare at the ceiling. And I felt two things. One, I couldn't understand why I was here. And two, I felt utterly alone. I mean, my whole family was home. I had just left a party where I was with all my friends. I'm constantly around people, but the only time I was ever alone was in my bed, which I hated to be in my bed, and I was so alone. And I mean, like, inside of me, guys, my, even now, I just start, my just God start going, oh, because I was so alone. And he said, I don't want any youth leaders up here. I don't want any youth pastors up here. I don't want any parents up here. Only kids who've been running from God. You know who you are. You've been running from God, and you know you need God. And if you want to get right with God, I don't want anybody else around you. It's between you and Jesus. You get right with God, and you come up here, and you get it right. And I needed that kind of challenge. I needed somebody to just get in my face. And I walked up stage right. There's a post just like that, just sitting in this little chapel. And I knelt down there and I started to pray and I started to weep. 
and it was like the Holy Spirit put on a movie of my life, which was not a pretty movie. It was kind of a movie you wouldn't want to send your kids to. And it was just like, and, and then he would hit pause. And I would say, God, will you please forgive me of that? I'm such a jerk. He'd say, yep, we're good. And then he'd start the movie again. And I'd say, God, will you forgive me of that? He'd say, yep, we're good. Went on for 45 minutes. I repented of all of my sins. <laughs> and I left out of that chapel that night. And I told God I would do anything he wanted me to do. I just have to have his voice in my life. And I got to tell you guys, I've been, I've been in ministry for 30 years. And whenever I stop hearing his voice, I start crying out to him, God, I need your voice. I must have the rush of your spirit in my life. I cannot just simply exist. I cannot simply just do life. I must have your voice in my life. And you guys, I, I, gotta, I can tell you with all complete honesty, I have, I have never felt alone since that day. I've been in trouble, I've been desperate, I've felt scared, but never alone. Because when I wake up in the middle of the night, and I don't know if this ever happens to you, but I wake up sometimes and I am so afraid. I, it overwhelms me that those people that live down the hall, the shorter ones, I'm responsible for them. And I'm thinking, how am I gonna do this? God, what am I gonna do? And God, I already know what I need to do. I need to just get up out of my bed and I need to go spend some time with him. You guys, camp for a kid changes their life because it gets them out of their daily routine and their daily life and they do really fun stuff. Tina and I, we bring our boat. We share our boat with, our, with the kids at camp. It's totally worth it to us. We want to spend time with those kids and let them know how much God loves them. And then they get in these services, and you guys, we watch them. And it's such a cool thing how God starts speaking. Don't you wish you could go to camp? Here's what I want to tell you. You need a place where you do that. I've been a pastor for 30 years. I've, talked, I've, I've heard so many pastors talk about prayer retreats. They go, and I always say, oh, I need to do that. I need to do that. You know how many I've done in 30 years? Two. One was last week, and one was last winter. And I, I do, I, I pray, and, and you know, I, I, I do the whole, I have, a, I have a kind of a routine, but I've never just taken my soul to camp. And so I did it last week. It felt so good. I want you to know that the, the, Jesus said, that if we will seek him with all of our heart, we will find him. And I got to tell you, to, to, to hear the voice of God is, is not as simple as we think it is. Because for you and I, when we want to listen to classic rock, we turn 102.5. It's very simple. It locks right on. 102.5 there. Do you want to listen to Christian radio? 105.3, 106.5. You just dial it and it's there and it's crystal clear and it stays there. Right? Hearing God's voice isn't like that. It's kind of like the transistor radio. Remember those? <laughs> got it. Don't move it. And then it goes out anyway. And you're like, oh, I got to go re... <laughs> it's, you know TV when you used to hold the foil for your dad? You know, you can try to watch the game. Yeah, it's like that. Because here's why. There's so much interference. We've got all this interference. We've got the radio. We've got TV. We, we've got movies. We've got our cell phone. I mean, like, it's like we're going to die if we don't know what our friends had for dinner. Do you want to try something crazy? Take these at dinner and put them in another room. Everyone's phone. I wish we would have done that when our kids were younger. Our kids do not have the skill of being without this. Failure for us as parents. They're all shaking their head over here. I could see them in the corner of my eye. I, that would be preposterous. That would be awful. I mean, like, you can't live without this thing. We do have a rule you can't look at at the table. But sometimes they just sit there like this. We're so inundated. And I will say that I have been a failure like that. 
where I'm so cluttered in my life and I really am learning that this Jehovah Ra, the good shepherd, he wants to speak. And I pray that you hear his voice. We're going to send kids to camp today. If you can help, awesome. If you can't help, I get it. We'll help you send your kids to camp. Okay, there's been times in my life when I needed some help. There's times in my life, like right now, where I can help. And I like being the helper more than the helped. But wherever you're at, it's okay. And if you're new here, thank you for coming. We don't pass the baskets twice. We don't try to shake you down. In fact, we always tell our new people, don't even feel like you have to give. But we will receive tithes and offerings. So the ushers are going to come up. These baskets are going to go by. I'd love it if you take that Connect card and put it, that in there. That would be wonderful. Uh, but we're so glad you came. And uh, maybe you weren't prepared to give. Um, you can do this if you wanted to do it with a giving envelope or write it on the check in the memo line. You could also do it online. Lots of people do online stuff. So like a lot of our people give online. So you can do that. But we're going to make sure kids don't miss camp because of money. We even take this out of our general fund if we have to. That's how important camp is. It changes a child's life. It changes a student's life. And so we're always going to send them. So um, make sure that you don't miss camp because of money. Okay, kids? There's lots of kids in here. Go tell your parents. Don't be proud. Matt said it. He'll pay for it. Just go sign me up, okay? I mean it. We'll get you there, okay? We want you to be there. Father, we love you. I pray, God, that you would speak to all of our hearts. I pray, God, that we would hear your voice personally, that we would be able, Lord, to live out you inside of us. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you'd pour your spirit out on our kids, that they would hear your voice and they would walk so closely with you, Lord. There would never be a, a time period of rebellion in their life. They would be so connected to you, Lord, that they could live out a rich and satisfying life every day of their life. And then none of our kids that graduate would stop going to church. In fact, they would take your church further and farther and greater and better than we could ever imagine because you're speaking to them. And I pray, Lord, that for all the youth in our area and all the churches in our area. We're not the only game in town, Lord. So God, multiply your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thanks for coming. God bless you guys today.